hear him, but unfortunately this morning his flight from Syracuse was canceled. And he unfortunately cannot be with us in person, but I am going to Skype with him right now, so I'm really sorry about that, but you can all wave to him in a second. sponsored by five institutes, and I couldn't remember them all on a piece of paper. So it's the Sigmar Center for Asian Studies, Institute for Security and Conflict Studies, the Community Network, the Institute for Foreign Policy Studies, and the China Energy Fund Committee. We will not have the welcome from all five institutes, but we'll have one brief one, and then we'll be in our way. Good afternoon, I'm Professor Ben Hopkins. I'm the uh, director of the Cedar Center of Asian Studies. On behalf of the Cedar Center and the other four co-sponsors of this event, uh, first of all, welcome, thank you very much. Apologies that you couldn't make it and join us in person, uh, Professor Steinberg, but we very much look forward to your uh, comments this afternoon. We had a very interesting uh, private session this morning and very much look forward to this afternoon's public presentation and questions to follow. I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Professor Steinberg and then I'll tell you one thing which is not on his former resume. Uh, he's a university professor of social sciences, international affairs, and law at the Syracuse University, where he previously served as the dean of the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Prior to this, he served as the deputy secretary of state, serving as the principal deputy to Secretary Clinton. From 2005 to 2008, mm -hmm. he was the dean of the uh, Lyndon Johnson Public School of Affairs. And from 2001 to 2005, he served as the vice president and director of foreign policy at the Brookings Institution, where he supervised a wide range of programs on the US foreign policy. He served as the deputy national security advisor to President Clinton from, two, from 1996 to 2000. Uh, he has one thing, uh, many of uh, uh, people who have been in public life so long don't. He talks very straight. Uh, he's, uh, 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 I've seen in the meetings, but those of us who you know, spend time in the State Department or White House know that most people kind of see when the is going, kind of hazard himself. Uh, Professor Steinberg talks straight English. Well, thank you. Um, I apologize for having to do this through technology, but I'm grateful that technology makes it possible. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. 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 Right, excellent. Um, so uh, thank you all. So it is a great pleasure to be virtually with you. Um, I feel like this is almost my first experience of speaking with a teleprompter, but because the way that uh, this works is I'm actually able to have the text of my speech in front of me rather than having to look down. So I don't know how it looks from your end, but it's quite a new experience for me on this end. Um, and I want to thank you for this timely opportunity to discuss US policy towards China and more broadly toward East Asia. Uh, I want to particularly thank Professor Etzioni for this invitation. I hate to date us both, but it was 45 years ago when I was a sophomore in social studies at Harvard that I first read The Active Society, a book that had a profound impact on me at that time and still has powerful insights that are relevant today. And Professor Etzioni continues to be a critically important uh, thinker uh, and active participant in the debates about American foreign policy and global policy in the world today. And it's been a pleasure to have been able to continue to work and engage with him over these many years. Now, as everyone knows, this is an election, one that is full of surprises. Uh, but for me, one of the biggest surprises is the dog that didn't, or at least hasn't barked, the fact that there has been little debate over US policy towards China. Who would have thought that it would be Russia and not China dominating the conversation? It could be because President Putin has deliberately courted attention 
while China's leaders have at least in relative terms laid low, as I'll discuss later. But of course, this is not typically the case. China has played an important part in many U.S. political campaigns since the communist takeover in 1949. Think of the contest between uh, Nixon and Helen Hagen Douglas for California Senate in 1950, when Nixon attacked her for supporting moving the UN Security Council chief seat from Taiwan to Peking. There you go. Um, in 1980, uh, candidate Reagan challenged President Carter for terminating the Taiwan Treaty. Uh, candidate Clinton in 1992 famously attacked President Bush for coddling the butchers of Beijing. With China's rise and the growing tensions in the South and East China Seas and over cyber intrusions, China would have made a likely target this year. Although China has figured to some extent in the trade debate, there hasn't been much debate over the broader strategy, though perhaps we will hear more during the debate tonight. And I should say at this point that while I was honored to work very closely with Secretary Clinton and President Obama on our policy towards East Asia, I speak today only for myself. Because China is not figured very prominently, no clear mandate for policy, irrespective of the outcome, will come out of this election. But what is clear is that the core consensus that has driven US policy is under increasing attack from all points of the compass. So this is a propitious time to assess whether the approach that has governed US policy for some 40 years is still relevant and appropriate today. The basic premise of that consensus is well known to all of you, summed up in the canonical phrase that the US seeks a strong and prosperous China. That consensus was based on three deep convictions, that the United States and China have a shared interest shared stake in the stability and prosperity of East Asia, that both stand to lose from unbridled rivalry, and the differences that do exist, especially with respect to our political and economic systems, while serious, could be managed constructively. This consensus not only benefited the people of the United States and China, but the rest of the region as well, including US allies. Despite periodic tensions, including over China's actions in Tiananmen Square in 1989, the missile firings near the Taiwan Straits in the mid-1990s, and the EP3 incident at the beginning of the Bush 43 administration, the region has experienced extraordinary prosperity and stability since the mid-1970s. Now, this consensus on policy was not without its critics. From the time of Nixon's first trip to the decision by President Carter to normalize relations with the PRC, and end our formal recognition and security ties to Taiwan, to, as I said, Tiananmen, the Taiwan Straits, missile crisis, and beyond. Successive American political campaigns featured candidates who accused the incumbent party of cozying up to communist dictators at the expense of American values and interests. But even when the challenger prevailed, policy tended to recur to the mean. President Reagan, after all, signed the third communique with China's leaders. President Clinton made a historic week-long trip to China in 1998 and helped usher in China's membership to the WTO. And President Bush worked closely with Chinese leaders on counterterrorism. The US policy was matched by China's apparent acceptance of the basic principles that allowed for the consensus to be maintained in the US. A willingness by China not to challenge the US-led liberal order in East Asia and beyond. From Deng Xiaoping's 24 character admonition to Taiwan Yang Wei, to the decision to join international regimes from the NBT and the WTO, China, for the most part, did not directly challenge the US, its allies, for the post World War II international order. As the millennium turned and China continued to rack up extraordinary economic growth, and with it, enhanced military and political power. The voices challenging the consensus continue to grow louder, especially in China among former members of the PLA. This was matched in turn by voices in the US who began to insist on the inevitability of the US-China confrontation. Yet the first decade of the 21st century proceeded relatively smoothly, aided by a shared post-9-11 focus on terrorism. But as the decade drew to a close, the alarm bell sounded again 
fueled by apparently expansive Chinese maritime claims in the East and South China Seas, and by a growing sense by Southern China that the financial crisis of 2008-2009 presaged an era of rapidly declining U.S. power and influence, creating an opening for greater Chinese assertiveness. Indeed, some in China began to argue that the time had come for China to abandon the self-effacing model advocated by Deng Xiaoping in favor of Mao's more assertive, a China that has stood up. These tensions surfaced early in the Obama administration and have only deepened since, matched by growing Chinese alarm and what many there see as the underlying premise of the Obama rebalance or pivot, a policy to contain China. As a result, the critics of the post-Nixon consensus policy have moved from the fringes of the American debate to the center, epitomized by the monograph issued just this past year by, Council on For by the Council on Foreign Relations, written by Bob Blackwell and Ashley Tellis, two certified card-carrying members of the foreign policy establishment in the US, calling explicitly for a policy to weaken China in order to sustain US privacy. Which brings us to the core question. Is this the end of the Arab consensus policy in which the US seeks constructive relations with China based on a Chinese willingness not to directly challenge the US role in the region and beyond? Should we now prepare for coming an inevitable contest of wills? Now much of this debate is over the future of US policy is a debate about how to assess China's intentions. Are Chinese goals maximalist to replace the US as the global hegemon, as some such as Michael Pillsbury have argued in his book, The Hundred Year Marathon? Was China's earlier restraint simply a matter of biding time until China became strong enough to assert its will? Or are China's aims more limited, but still deeply problematic, such as seeking a Chinese version of the Monroe Doctrine for East Asia, as perhaps foreshadowed in Xi Jinping's comments at the 2014 Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building, where he called for Asian problems to be solved by Asians themselves. Are Chinese territorial claims self-limiting to recover of territory lost in the 19th and early 20th century and promised back at the Tehran and Potsdam conferences? Or are China's moves primarily defensive, simply to prevent a recurrence of the century of humiliation? Scholars of varying stripes have offered their answers to these questions based on their own academic bent. Some neorealists have argued that a future of conflict is foreordained by the inevitable tensions between a rising and an established power, the so-called Thucydides trap. Although, as my good friend Joe Nye has pointed out, Thucydides may well have gotten wrong in terms of why Sparta and Athens really did go to war. Others from academics like John Eikenberry to practitioners like Don Gross, argue that economic interdependence will inevitably temper conflict and lead to crisis management rather than confrontation. Others, myself included, fret about an emerging security dilemma that, irrespective of the intentions of each side, could lead to a lose-lose and even catastrophic lose-lose outcome, an outcome all too vivid as we mark the centennial of the slaughter that was World War I. Put another way, how should we understand current Chinese foreign policy? As a long-term strategic plan to restore the glory of the Qinlong Emperor? As the most recent manifestation of long-term strategic Chinese culture, the assassin's mace? As an adaptation to the shifting balance of regional and economic military power? as the Communist Party's strategy for diverting domestic discontent by mobilizing nationalist pride, as the weakness of civilians in the face of increasingly powerful military, as the outgrowth of increasing cult of personality around President Xi. It is that uncertainty, uncertainty about intentions which lies at the heart of the challenge of developing a sound policy for the United States. And that uncertainty takes many forms. Part of the uncertainty lies in the nature of the political process in China itself, opaque and secretive. But even if we could determine with some confidence the innermost secrets of Zhang Hai, that is the intentions of the current leaders, that wouldn't tell us 
very much necessarily about what the intentions of future leaders may be. And for long-range policy, those future intentions are at least as consequential as the current leader's intentions. And even if we had some insight into who those leaders would be and what their intentions would be, exogenous events, as my political scientist friends would say, could throw all that prognostication into a cocked hat. In the end, policy, all policy, based on future intentions, is subject to what I call radical uncertainty. And that humble acknowledgment of radical uncertainty, rather than the confident predictions of both pundits and scholars, must lie at the heart of a sound approach. Uncertainty can have pernicious effects on policy. In the face of uncertainty, it seems tempting, indeed sublimely rational, to adopt a hedging strategy. Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. The problem with hedging strategies, as you all know, is that they can be quite self-fulfilling. It looks like a hedge to one actor can look quite threatening to the other and induce a reciprocal hedge that accelerates the downward spiral of the security dilemma. To break this spiral, many have advocated the strategy of building trust. But trust building is also subject to many of the difficulties that gives rise to uncertainty in the first place. Our host and others have called for a grand bargain between the United States and China. But putting aside for the moment the very considerable problems of what each side should be willing to concede and the potentially destabilizing effects such as G2 would have on the other countries in the region whose interests might not well be, be well reflected in the bargain, what confidence would either side have that that bargain would hold? Both historians and theorists have long cautioned about the unreliability of diplomats' grand bargains, bargains that would lead to, if I could use the phrase, peace in our time, but in fact represent just an opening move in what would ultimately prove a deadly and prolonged conflict. It's no accident that President Reagan, therefore, in dealing with the Soviet Union, insisted on trust but verify. An alternative approach uh, was proposed by my good friend and colleague Michael Hanlon and me in our book, Strategic Reassurance and Resolve. As the students in this audience will hopefully recognize, the title evokes two of the key concepts that strategists have identified as a way to help bound uncertainty and help policymakers make a realistic assessment of the prospects for either cooperation or rivalry based on the real rather than imagined goals of each side. Put another way, strategies of reassurance can help reduce the risk of conflict from misplaced fears, while resolve can help reduce the risk that will, that, um, from underestimating the other's willingness to act to protect its interests. Now, neither of these tools by themselves will mitigate against rivalry or even conflict if our interests are truly adverse. But they can help make it possible for us to work together if and where, as Professor Etzioli and others have argued, our interests really are converged, or at least complementary. And it at least will help assure that if we do have conflict, it will be over real and important rather than imagined or secondary differences. As the new administration takes office, beginning of next year, there are two areas which are ripe for this approach and where the failure to pursue them could, in the very near term, lead to a dangerous downturn in the bilateral relationship. The two areas, I think, will be obvious to all of you here, the maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas and North Korea's nuclear and missile program. In the South and East China Sea, one important measure of reassurance available to China would be to take up the proposed moratorium on new island reclamation and expanded maritime operations, reflected in the ASEAN proposed uh, conduct, uh, code of conduct for East Asia. President Xi indicated at least a partial willingness to take this approach by his commitment to no further militarization when he met recently with President Obama. But the situation on the ground is not so comforting. Encouragingly, Although China's hostile rhetoric in response to the UNCLOS arbitration decision has raised anxieties, the worst fears of pundits have not yet, at least today, materialized. China's restraint in response to the arbitral reward, particularly with regard to the Scarborough Shoal and the possibility of an air defense identification zone, 
send an important signal of reassurance and could become the basis for a more comprehensive framework, which would leave the underlying territorial disputes unresolved, but mitigate the spiral of tension. Similarly, a scaling down of Chinese naval and air operations around the Senkaku Islands could also send a powerful message of reassurance. Perhaps even more important in shaping the future of US-China relations is the growing urgency of dealing with North Korea's nuclear and missile program. There's a lot of debate about what China can and should do about North Korea, and whether China prioritizes retaining a stable north over effective measures to reduce or eliminate the missile and nuclear threat. But China's actions to date, while helpful to some degree, have not provided US policymakers with the necessary reassurance that our goals really are aligned. And in the absence of that reassurance, the US and its allies have, I believe, no choice but to demonstrate resolve toward North Korea by prudent defensive measures, such as the deployment of a bad missile defense system, and by increasing economic pressure on the North Korean leadership, up to and including secondary sanctions, even if both of these types of measures will be seen as unfriendly or even hostile by China. Given that the situation on the peninsula is deteriorating rapidly, it's, on, it's incumbent on China to reassure the US and South Korea and Japan that its commitment to a non-nuclear peninsula is more than rhetoric. This should be at the top of the new administration's agenda in its first engagements with China's leadership, not only because of the urgency of the question, but also because the failure to find a satisfactory common way forward could have serious consequences for the relationship as a whole. Both the maritime disputes and the challenge of North Korea have a common dimension, which lies at the heart of the long-term management of US-China relations. In both cases, the US interests are closely connected to the interests and concerns of our treaty allies and other partners in the region. China's leaders often criticize these ties as relics of the Cold War, as symptoms of an ill-disguised containment strategy like the one pursued by the US both in Europe and East Asia during the Cold War. In China, they point to the US support for the Philippines' recourse to arbitration on the South China Sea, on the security commitment to Japan in connection with the Sekakus, and with the US-South Korean decision to deploy THAAD to counter the North Korean missile threat, all being manifestations of US hostile intent. The Chinese complaints in some respect mirror President Putin's criticism of the persistence of NATO as a hostile act directed at Russia. Both Chinese and Russian leaders argue that we should abandon these historic alliances. But in both cases, I believe they are profoundly wrong. <coughs> Rather than a source of instability and conflict, our alliances in East Asia and in Europe are the indispensable anchor for regional stability and security. These alliances allow our partners to develop close ties with their powerful near neighbors, that is China and Russia, without risking their independence or having themselves to resort to dangerous military buildups of their own to counter a possible threat. U.S. withdrawal from these commitments would deepen anxiety in both regions, benefiting no one, including China or Russia for that matter. Abrogating these relationships to assuage China and Russia's concerns would undermine confidence in U.S. reliability and commitment, rippling instability to other regions as well. Thus, the United States needs to continue to insist that while we are prepared to look for ways to reassure China about the goals and actions of our alliances, for example, in the case of explaining the purpose of limited capabilities in the defense system, we are not prepared to walk away. All of these considerations point to the need for a serious, candid, and credible dialogue between the United States and China at the highest and authoritative levels. To their credit, Presidents Obama and Xi have recognized the importance of this engagement and have broken all previous world records for leader-to-leader -leader dialogue, both in frequency and scope. This engagement at the top has produced a few hopeful signs, from the climate agreement, the agreement last September, to try to address economic cyber espionage. But the results have not been broad or consequential enough to end the downward drift of the relationship. 
credible mechanisms to sustain the dialogue and make sure it produces concrete results in the intervals between leaders' meetings are essential to create a virtuous circle of problem solving that builds reassurance and stabilizes the relationship. This, of course, may appear much less glamorous than grand bargains, but it could prove a more durable and realistic approach in the long term. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, thank you very much for a very uh, comprehensive and uh, clear uh, presentation. I think the least you're going to take from it that we're never going to talk again about a grand bargain. Maybe a series of smaller bargains. Uh, I think uh, extremely well taken uh, point. And it's uh, very good you can hear us. I should also mention that we'll share your text, which you kindly provide us. So those of you who want to take notes, maybe again, you'll be able uh, to you know, use I have, I have to forgive there are a few typos that I saw as I read through, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. Okay, we promise to give you a, a proof text uh, after those. Uh, uh, I, I just want to uh, mention a few things from our day-long discussion with our uh, Chinese uh, uh, colleagues. I think, first of all, uh, since I think correctly you stressed that intentions are so difficult to measure and rely on, that we looked at underlying basic objective interests as an observer. We uh, look at them, and we find a long list of issues on which uh, China and the United States, and if you came from a, you may reporter from the Lunar Times, came from Moon, uh, that there are a, a, a long list of interests which are either identical or converging, such as I mentioned, uh, the concern about climate, uh, about spread of nuclear weapons, about jihadist terrorism, uh, economic interdependence. There's really a long issue on which uh, uh, there's really uh, no need for gun bargain or not even for a small bargain, be uh, because, as you pointed out, if you can look beyond those uh, symbolic issues, if you take a rock and make out of it a mountain, uh, that we, we could uh, really never a lot to range of things which need to be discussed. When it came to the subset of those remaining issues, and you mentioned uh, uh, two major ones, uh, I, I think there was a feeling that while uh, uh, a gun bargain uh, surely is not possible, a series of uh, discussions, including the one you emphasize so important in your book, trust and verify uh, that those would be uh, possible. And I'll just add one more line here, which I personally uh, particularly care about. And that is uh, what I would like to call the issue of salience. Uh, often, often when we talk about uh, negotiations, we don't take into account that there are areas in which some issues are very important to one side, but are very important to the other side, and vice versa. So uh, uh, if somebody cares a lot about oranges, but not that much about apples, and God willing the other side, a lot of our apples, not oranges. We, we are ready for a great deal. I give you apples, you give me oranges. But it presumes that there's a different ranking after things we consider important. So uh, from that viewpoint, and that's my last comment, uh, our United States number one concern seems to some of us is the uh, development in North Korea with long-range missiles and nuclear weapons, a, a major major threat to United States security. About the only realistic way we can get a handle on that would be through cooperation of China. But it's asking China to do us a favor is really uh, uh, not a very realistic conversation. The question is, are there some things which are very important to China, which are not that important to us, that uh, we could put on the table so to get from China to take the, the painful and difficult step of uh, twisting the arm of its only ally, basically, and the dangers of military Koreans <coughs> will show up on uh, China's uh, border. Uh, now, I don't want to say, as an American, what are China's top interests. I think it's for China to tell us what are its top interests. But for instance, I could imagine that China would not be uh, too offended if we point out that one of the results of such a development would be there'd be no reason for us to put out an anti-missile defense in uh, uh, South Korea 
I can imagine from a Chinese viewpoint, such a shield is very destabilizing. Because while the United States says it's only going to stop North Korean missiles, there's really no way for China to know uh, if you're not also stop uh, other missiles, and that everybody, I think, is very destabilizing. <coughs> I don't want to take another minute to spell out, but the basic idea is we are drifting toward war. War is always bad for all concerns, even if we win. We have no idea what we're going to do after the argument. I think all the documents issued by the hands and our military, those are not classified. And none of them talks about what happened the after we win. Kind of, it's like Iraq all over again. We, we, we have no plan for peace. Uh, but you're going to rebuild China. So first of all, uh, I think avoiding war is our, will be our number one, two, three priority. For both of us, uh, the range of issues which are there, in which there are real differences is small. And the remaining ones, I think, uh, uh, maybe a transition negotiation, <laughs> very fun uh, results if you take into account difference in sales. So uh, at that point, uh, if you uh, uh, address uh, uh, Professor Steinberg with uh, the assembly of the microphone, and so if you raise your hand, uh, who has the microphone? Uh, you you want to bring it over here? Okay. It's coming. Hi. Um, okay, just one second. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Yang Qiyu from Beijing. Uh, Professor Sandberg, thank you for, uh, for your presentation. I have a question. You mentioned that the two, uh, two, two, the two governments should have a candid and a serious dialogues on fundamental issues. Uh, now, you also mentioned the two areas uh, the, the new administration will deal with with China. And uh, by your opinion, what kind of uh, subjects uh, should be in the list on the candid, serious dialogues between the two countries, and what format the dialogue should be, uh, making use of the existing format like an S and an ED, or something else? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Great, great questions. Um, I'm getting feedback, so if you could move the mic. Or maybe turn right. Um, now, can you turn off the mic? Is that possible? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes, okay, that's good. Sorry, it's just a feedback after me, so it's I, I, harder for me to keep my thoughts organized. So, great questions. Um, I think that everyone make a point about the, both the substance and about the process. Um, on the substance, you know, I'm obviously more, more of an expert on the, the political and security issues than on the economic issues, so I'm going to speak to those. But that doesn't mean that the economic issues aren't extremely important in terms of their political salience. They may be even more important uh, in terms of stabilizing the relationship. But uh, when it comes to trade and currency and the like, I prefer to defer to my colleagues who know more about them. I think that you know the, the challenge that we face in dealing with these issues is both um, the specific issues, which themselves pose problems to relationships, and the there are consequences of proxy for broader you know, other issues. And so, you know, when I spoke of uh, the maritime disputes in North Korea, these are obviously very critical uh, in their own right. The South China Sea is, you know, 40% of the world's trade passes through the South China Sea. Obviously, the nuclear threat from North Korea is, is important. And so, the, the consequences of, of failing to address these in themselves is very important. But they also raise questions, precisely because we haven't made progress on them, about what, whether there are some underlying reasons as to why they've not been, our agreement hasn't been made, about what the long-term strategy is of both sides. So our concern that, that China's actions in the maritime dispute is basically trying to establish at least regional hegemony. Um, China's concern that our engagement in the, the, those disputes are examples of the United States wanting to maintain privacy and to contain China. So they're important in their own right, but they, they, they become especially important because of their salience to the broader question about the long-term relationship. So when identifying what I think are the priority issues, I look for both of those criteria, which is things that are, that are consequential, but also seem to be connected to a broader set of issues. In that respect, I think that the cyber issues are enormously important. They're very complicated but they do really go to a, a sense of confidence. We both obviously have robust cyber capabilities, which could be very damaging 
and very uh, threatening to each other. Uh, and so finding a way to manage those are extremely important. The safety of space assets is another area that Michael Handel and I talked about. Both of us are enormously dependent on space-based assets, both for economics and security. They're very vulnerable, there are lots of risks, and we have essentially no uh, understandings about how to mitigate those risks. So that's another area of, uh, of considerable uh, concern. And on the nuclear and missile defense front is another area which I'm quite preoccupied with. Um, up till now, China has been fairly restrained in its offensive nuclear uh, capability, but there are elements of modernization which are concerned to, uh, the US. And similarly, obviously, China is concerned about elements of our own military modernization. So it's a, it's a robust agenda of political and security issues in addition to economic issues and, and the like. Um, I would put Pakistan on the list as well as another area which is a considerable concern and considerable risk um, that would be uh, a candidate for early high-level dialogue. Now, in terms of the process, um, as I said, at the leader-to-leader -leader level, we've, we've actually seen quite an extraordinary amount of engagement, uh, not only the kind of unusual summit meetings, uh, but because there are so many more um, leaders' meetings, uh, including because the U.S. is now in the East Asia Summit, we have East Asia Summit, we have APEC, uh, we have the G20, uh, and, uh, and the, the leaders gatherings we saw just recently at, uh, in New York at UNGA, uh, the meeting between President Obama and Lee Cheng. Um, so the leaders are talking to each other a lot, and it's been supplemented with a very important uh, uh, additional feature, which was the Sunnyland style dialogue. And although I have not privileged the details of uh, the conversations, I do know from those who have been involved that these are quite far reaching, quite candid, and really do get to some of these very difficult and important issues. But the problem is that leaders' meetings alone, I don't think, can help us solve these problems. They need good preparation, and they need good follow-up. And that, I think, is the place where we have not yet uh, solved the problem. The SNED is a very valuable innovation. Uh, as you know, it began in the uh, Bush 43 administration. We raised the level uh, so that on the uh, political and security side, the uh, American leader was the Secretary of State rather than a deputy. I was not offended that Secretary Clinton took that role away from me and took it for herself. I thought that was the right choice uh, for the uh, relationship. Uh, and But the strength of the SDD is its breadth and the fact that so many officials are there and the agenda is so broad, which really attests to the breadth of the issues that we have, potential areas of common interest and opportunity. But it has kind of squeezed out the ability to drill down and really deeply engage on a small number of core issues, the, the level of kind of sustained, multi-day conversation at the highest and most candid level between the next level down and below the president, secretaries, deputy secretaries, and the like, I think has not been achieved to the same degree. And we don't have these kind of channels to work through these very, very difficult issues that are very sensitive that you know, can't be discussed in front of hundreds of officials that require high-level discussion and require a lot of confidence uh, in each side about the other to be open to private exploration of possible solutions. Uh, we have some of that. I'm not saying there's none. Um, and as I said, in the, in the cyber area, we may have actually benefited from the decision by President Xi to send his senior official um, to Washington prior to the leaders meeting to explore what might be done, and there's some evidence that that may have had some success. So that's a good model. Uh, based on my own experience, uh, one prior example of this was in the mid-1990s when I served as the head of policy planning under President Clinton and um, Secretary uh, Christopher, when we ran into some very serious difficulties on the non-proliferation front and concerns about Chinese tech transfers to Pakistan. And Secretary Christopher and his counterpart, uh, uh, the Former minister and then later state councilor, uh, Chen Chi Chen, um, engaged in a number of very far reaching and very creative conversations, which led to a resolution of those very serious and potentially very damaging issues because the US was heading down a road to imposing significant sanctions as a result of China's actions. So that's what I would focus on, is supplementing these more formal mechanisms like the JCCT and the SNED with a, a very far-reaching candid dialogue at very senior levels uh, below 
that of the presidents. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I, I'm calling first on our guest who came all the way from China uh, to uh, uh, listen to Jim Stanbrook. Good afternoon, Professor Jim Stanbrook, Kawan Zhao from Kent. It's nice to listen to you again. Well, personally, I agree with you that the North Korea problem is the most critical problem for both China and the United States. But then, what would you suggest China to do with regard to North Korea? You know, I think that China can play, help deal with both sides of the development point, which is um, to make clear to North Korea that um, if the regime's interest is in its long-term survival, which is what I assume the interest of Kim Jong-un and those around him is, that uh, the only path to assuring the regime's future is to begin to deal seriously with the nuclear missile problems. And on the one hand, if, it, if North Korea fails to do so, then China will join the United States in really taking the kinds of actions that would be very problematic for the future of the regime. But conversely, if North Korea does take those measures, that China can help make North Korea feel more uh, certain that a decision to move away from nuclear weapons will not risk the regime. I mean, to the extent that the regime, the North Korean regime, feels that these are necessary for deterrence, which obviously we don't feel is at all justified, but if they feel that way, China can help work with the United States to provide those assurances to the North that it will not be jeopardizing its security by moving down that road. So it has to work on both sides. It has to both, it has to have the, 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 the stick and the carrot. And, and I think China is uniquely well positioned to convey that dual message that the only way for the regime to really be uh, assured of its future is to move down that step. Now, I mean, we all understand that, that both sides of this entail some risks. Uh, the relationship between the North and China is not unambiguously good. And there's there's a lot of tension there as well. So uh, the, the potential implicit threats from China do run some risks of instability and reaction from the North. But what I think it has to be clear now, and I think is increasingly clear in the US, and I hope is becoming clear in China, is that continuing the status quo is, is not an answer. We are, we are going to be in a conflict situation <coughs> if this continues, because the risks to South Korea, to Japan, and to the United States are simply growing too great for, the, for us to just stand by and hope that China will solve this problem. So I think that should concentrate the minds of Chinese leaders and understand that, that while the temptation is to just kind of hope that things will work out, that it's not happening and that the situation will get worse unless China plays a more active role on both sides of the question. Any, anyone from our Chinese colleagues? Okay, please. Hi, my name is Andrew Hanna, I'm with Politico. Um, right now, the prospects of passing TPP to the Congress are starting to look pretty grim. My question is, if TPP fails to pass the Congress, what are the consequences for the U.S.-China relationship, and what are the options available to the next president to pursue an East Asian trade agenda, considering both have disavowed the TPP? That's a very, a very interesting question, and you know I think that that, that kind of the, there, most of the focus of the analysis about TPP has been the impact on our relationships with the, the partners in TPP, which is you know China is not. Um, one could sort of facilely conclude that actually China would be very happy about this because it would mean that the United States wasn't building closer ties, economic ties, to the other countries in the region. But I actually think that you know, TPP potentially could have benefits for China as well, because the, the standards and principles that are embodied in many of the provisions of TPP are actually things that might help China pursue its own economic reform and provide an incentive for China to undertake the kind of market reforms uh, and dealing with issues like the state-owned enterprises, um, which are very much in China's interest. So in some ways, although China's not a signatory to TPP, it could help the, the cause of economic reform, just as China's entry into the WTO um, uh, helped not only provide a mechanism for dealing with trade disputes between China and the United States, but also provide a, a template for China's own internal reforms. So, um, you know, I think that uh, the prospects for TPP are not good. 
But I also think that at least uh, one of the candidates has said that uh, she's open to improvements and changes in there, and that could provide a basis for going forward. I don't want to predict how negotiable that will be or how it will turn out. But more broadly speaking, it's obviously in the interest of everyone if we can find a good basis and a sustainable basis for expanding trade within the region, both among the TPP countries, and to have those high standards uh, reflected in the activities of um, China as well. And I think that uh, as we move forward, it's also important for all of us to recognize that these trade agreements have caused a great deal of anxiety, and that uh, if we want long-term support for trade and the positive benefits of interdependence, then we have to demonstrate that um, the trade agreements uh, provide benefits for everyone involved, and not just some segments. Okay. Daniel, sir, we're now directing the conflict management program at Johns Hopkins SAIS. Hi, Dan. Good to see you, Jim. Uh, it seems to me your talk is premised on an assumption of relative success economically for China. But I wonder if I can ask you to speculate on the implications for the political and security realms. If that proves out to be false, as the assumptions about Japan were, as the assumptions about the Soviet Union were, what happens if, uh, if Chinese growth falters and if uh, credit issues, internal credit issues, become as severe as they became for Japan? Well, great question, Dan. Um, so I think, uh, ironically, um, you know, the the fact that China faces these growing economic difficulties should give Chinese leaders all the more powerful reason to focus on the need to sustain stability in the region. Because if they're going to be dealing with the pressures of, of sustaining public support in the case of declining economics, a, a further shock to the system uh, from conflict uh, would be devastating. Um, it would, and there's been a lot of modeling. Some of you may have seen a recent study that Rand has done about the, the impact, potential kinds of conflict between the United States and China. And China suffers much more seriously in terms of the economic impact of conflict. So I, I think it has been one of the great bits of wisdom of Chinese leaders over the last several decades to understand that China's principal goal is its economic development and becoming a moderately well-off society and that the absolute essential condition for that is in a stable region that's conducive to trade and investment. So I would think that the very fact that there are economic issues should lead Chinese leaders to have an even greater incentive to look for ways to maintain stability. There's obviously a familiar argument from political science that when you face economic difficulties and political pressure, you, want, you might want to externalize conversionary um, uh, measures, but I, I think that it works up to a point, but it is it, there's a limit to how far that works. And it certainly would be kind of productive to pursue a strategy that, although designed to distract the public, would actually exacerbate the underlying causes of the tension. Hi, uh, Professor Steinberg, Chung Report China Daily. Uh, Ambassador Stapleton Roy last week talked about uh, you know, a lot of uh, U.S. assumption about the region, Asia Pacific, and East Asia are uh, outdated, you know, based on outdated assumptions. So uh, you talked about, uh, you blame the China for North Korean issue. I mean, a lot of people uh, criticize Obama's approach, so-called the strategic patience or whatever, not engaging, talking, contacting with North Korea. I mean, so that then, I mean, sanction had failed repeatedly. I mean, and showed no result. Why you think it will, we should still go down the path? And uh, you know, uh, I know so you served a long time in the Clinton administrations. Uh, so do you think? I mean, the so and what people worried about the strategic rivalry between China and U.S. will get worse under a new President Clinton, uh, or it will be better under President Trump? I I know maybe. I know you have uh, maybe uh, you know personal view, but anyway, I want to see. I mean, you know, a lot of uh, Chinese uh, like Bill Clinton, but they also believe uh, Hillary Clinton uh, is a hawkish, as many in Washington D.C. believe. 
and Trump, I mean, then test it, but you know, there's no possibility. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think you'll recall, that's not how old you are, but uh, when President Clinton was first elected, many people in China were very skeptical about President Clinton, who were very much hopeful that uh, President Bush would continue, and things turned out okay. So I, I'm not sure that current views of the public and even officials about what may or may not happen under second President Clinton um, necessarily reflect the reality there. I want to focus on the North Korea question a little bit more because I, I, I don't know what Steve had to say, but I, and to some, some of your assumptions I quite don't agree with. You know, the, the notion that the United States is not be willing to talk to North Korea is, is just patently false. Um, that we had an agreement with North Korea during the first Clinton administration, and while um, we had an agreement about dealing with the plutonium problem, North Korea developed a clandestine uranium enrichment program, uh, which allowed it to pretend that it was moving towards the denuclearization of the on the plutonium front, well, it was moving gangbusters ahead on uranium enrichment that developed nuclear weapons. So we, we talked, we had an agreement, and the North didn't abide by it. There was another agreement in 2006 under the uh, Bush administration, and the North didn't abide by that. There was another agreement in the Obama administration, the so called uh, Lee <coughs> Agreement, in which we at least had a modest agreement on uh, a moratorium on development of missiles and testing, and North Korea didn't go along with that. So there's been persistent, sustained engagement and willingness to talk in a variety of forms. Certainly from the first day of the Obama administration, we made clear that uh, we wanted to talk and we wanted to see if we could make progress. And within a few months of taking office, President Obama taking office, the North Koreans conducted tests. So I, I don't think the problem here is on the unwillingness of the United States to talk. It's the unwillingness of the North Koreans to seriously address this issue. I think the Obama administration has always been ready to talk. And I'm sure future administrations of whatever stripe will be willing to talk. But it's, it, and by talking just for talking's sake, um, doesn't accomplish anything. I suppose you could do it, but it doesn't really accomplish much. And the track record is very, very poor on the North Korean side. So we need to find a way to get out of this. Uh, we've repeatedly asked North Korea to demonstrate that it's willing to go back to the 2006 agreement, to take some steps to show that it's serious. Everyone understands that denuclearization is not going to happen overnight. But the uh, journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step, and that was the goal of the Lee Day Agreement. Uh, and if the North were prepared to move back to that, I suspect there'd be some receptivity to that as well. So I, I think that you say the circumstances have changed. It's certainly true that sanctions up till now haven't worked, but it's just as equally likely that the response will be tougher sanctions rather than uh, somehow a willingness to make more concessions. Uh, which seems to be the North Korean uh, assumptions here. And so I think you know, everyone understands that a diplomatic resolution would be good. Uh, and that there are, as I said in my talk, that the, um, the North Koreans, or the answer to the question, I should say, the North Koreans have understood, you know, looked for some measures to have some confidence that it won't become more insecure if it goes down this road. But President Bush made those offers of commitments and assurances when he was president, President Obama has made those offers offers of assurance. And so the, the, the material for moving forward is there if the North is serious. But I think at the moment, uh, the, the North has uh, concluded that it doesn't want to move in that direction. And because of the risk that represents, I just don't believe that the status quo is going to be able to be sustained. Let me take two more questions and then we'll hear uh, from uh, Dr. Patrick Ho and get some closing comments. Please. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Anushka, and I come from the Philippines. Knowing that the pressing issue faced by Southeast Asian states now is the dispute over the South China Sea, how do you think China, the U.S., and their Southeast Asian allies can come to terms when dealing with this issue and their varying, varying claims? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you know, this is a critical issue for uh, all concerned because of both the uh, tensions that it's risen and the importance of the region. As I said in my talk, I think that we have an opportunity to, these are difficult uh, territorial claims, but the, the territorial claims between and disputes between China and its neighbors are long-standing. And really until the late first decade of the 21st century, um, we had all lived under the very wise perspective uh, offered by Deng Xiaoping that none of us were smart enough to know how to resolve these problems. And so we should simply put them off and look for a modus vivendi that worked in the South China Sea, that worked in the East China Sea. Uh, lots of people are pointing the fingers as to who broke that kind of operating consensus down. 
But I don't think it really matters historically who, who was at fault. The question is whether we can now take some steps simply to, to stabilize the situation, understanding that the underlying disputes may be longstanding. I often tell the story, um, people don't realize it, but the United States still has a couple of outstanding territorial disputes, including one uh, with uh, Canada over the uh, Machado Islands off the coast of Maine, Canada. Uh, we still fight over it. We still disagree as to who owns them, but we haven't uh, gone to war over them because we basically allowed uh, ways for our fishermen to fish around there and, and continue to get along. So I think taking advantage of the idea of a moratorium or some of the principles in the ASEAN Code of Conduct uh, will stabilize the situation and allow us to think over the long term about how to move to a long term resolution. <laughs> Ray Riddle from Radio Free Asia. I want to go back to the uh, issue of uh, North Korea. The most hot issue today, it must be the Chinese uh, woman, the Chinese company, Hongxiang Company in Dandong, which helped uh, the North Korean build up his uh, nuclear missile. Uh, it's a good news for you since it happened uh, between 2012 to 2014, that is after your tenure in the State Department. Uh, for all those four years of the Chinese denial that they haven't had any involvement, in the, uh, in the North Koreans' uh, nuclear issue, what mistake the American has made, uh, and what should we counter uh, all those denial that on the during the past five years that even nowadays the Chinese said they deny they have any involvement uh, to the North Korean uh, nuclear project until last week that their local police uh, uh, seizure and uh, captured the woman who is a local uh, lawmaker and also a dedicated uh, uh, Communist Party member. So my question is twofold. First, what mistake the American government has made? Uh, that's, be that's after your uh, service in the State Department. Uh, any mistake we can learn from it. And second, uh, why can we trust the Chinese government again? Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I've learned over the years that uh, not to comment on facts that I'm not personally familiar with. So I've read the reports that you cited, but I don't have any independent knowledge about that company or what has or hasn't been done. So let me just try to answer this in general terms. I think the United States has understood that this is a complicated issue for China and has tried to find ways to work with China in a non-threatening way to come to a common approach. Uh, and we've made some progress. There have been a number of, of times in which we've moved forward to tighten sanctions to the Security Council. But as you said, you know, the, the, the result is insufficient. So I don't know whether you call it a mistake or not, but we have not succeeded. And therefore, we have to find ways to do more. And China needs to understand that if we cannot find common ways to do more, the United States and its partners will do things on its own uh, that we feel are necessary, which China may not prefer. So finding the agreed path forward. And, and make it clear that we're going to keep working this problem urgently until we make progress rather than sort of half-heartedly is the key. We have to, we have to the, the place to start is to agree that we must succeed at this because otherwise the conflict's going to break out anyway. And therefore, we must agree on a path forward and we must agree what we will do if the, the first steps we take aren't good enough. And I think that that needs to be understood in Beijing. That this is, the time has come, has come for us to begin to have a, a focused effort which has a goal in mind to get there. And while there are many, many differences between the situations in Iran and North Korea, the situation in Iran proves that when the United States and China work together and have a clear commitment to the goal, the results can be pretty good. <coughs> uh, before I turn over to uh, Dr. Patrick Ho, a uh, friend from China, I, I ask you all to join me to thank Jim for a very comprehensive, thoughtful, and informative answer. Thank you very much. Thank you.